In your daily life, whether you are aware of it or not, contract law plays a huge part. When you go to the shop to buy a litre of milk or a sandwich at lunchtime, when you buy a Lewis ticket or a Dart ticket or a bus ticket or any sort of a transport ticket, when you buy a car, when you buy a house, when you sell a house, your contract of employment, all of these are instances of a contract coming into contact with your daily life. And in this video, I'm going to look at the essentials of contract law in Ireland. Okay, the first thing you need to know about a contract, or contract law is what is a contract? As I say, it's a huge feature of our daily lives. It's a, a legal definition, it's an agreement enforceable at law between two or more parties whereby rights are acquired by one or more persons in return for certain acts or forbearances on the part of the other or others. The parties essentially agree to terms and conditions and provided you and the other party are in agreement and have negotiated your terms and conditions unless those terms and conditions are outside the law or unlawful then you will have a valid contract and it's up to you and the other party to decide what you want to put in it. There are three components of a contract, a valid enforceable contract. One, agreement, agreement between the parties, between you and the other person. Two is consideration and three is the intention to create legal relations. Let's have a look at those three building blocks of a contract. In relation to agreement, you're going to need offer, you're going to need acceptance and you're going to need to ensure that the offer and acceptance are clear and unequivocal. An invitation to treat is not an offer. An invitation to treat is, for example, when a solicitor like myself might send out a contract for the sale of a property. It is only when the other party, having got legal advice from their solicitor, signs the contract and returns it, that is when an offer comes into, into being. However, prior to that, when I send out the contract, that is only an invitation to treat. Another example of invitation to treat could be advertising in general. In other words, there are certain offers made, etc., etc., but a lot of it could be in the way of or considered to be invitations to treat and terms and conditions will apply and you'll probably see a small uh, message at the bottom of a lot of advert ads stating that terms and conditions apply to any particular offer. An offer can be withdrawn and it can be accepted, it can be rejected or a counter offer can be made and if a counter offer is made well then the original offer is not accepted. It's essential too for a binding contract or a valid contract to come into being that there is an intention to create legal relations. A social agreement or offer does not create a contract. The parties must have intended to create legal relations and be legally bound. For example, if I promise you and tell you that I'll meet you for coffee tomorrow at one o'clock in O'Connell Street or Grafton Street, or if I promise you to bring you to a hurling match or a football match or a rugby match next weekend and fail to do so. That is not, it's just a social agreement, it's a social promise. We may have agreed to meet up, you may have agreed to buy me a pint in return for me giving you the lift, but it's not going to be a valid contract and neither of us then can sue on foot of it. So if I don't show up uh, or if you don't buy the pint, you cannot or we cannot sue each other. Consideration then is something that must be present in a contract and it is something of value. It must have legal value. Now having said that, even a peppercorn or one euro is sufficient consideration, but there must be consideration that has legal value. Past consideration is not sufficient to enforce a new contract. Contracts then can be oral or written. Uh, it's easier obviously if there's a dispute to enforce a contract if it's in writing because the terms and conditions of the agreement are clearly ascertainable. However, if you go into a shop and buy a pound of mince or if you go into a butcher shop or go and buy a litre of milk or whatever, 
there's no written contract there but you have a contract uh, and you are protected by contract law and by statute and there is a contract there in being and implied terms obviously uh, and even in express terms courtesy of statute would be that the stuff that's being sold to you is of merchantable quality and is fit for purpose and so on and so forth but just because you don't have to sign a written contract to say that you're getting you know five litres of milk and two sliced pans doesn't mean that there's no contract in place there certainly is and uh, you can sue for breach of contract if uh, anything arises uh, from that some other contractual issues then to be considered would be things like undue influence and duress they will render a contract voidable so you can't put so much pressure on somebody or take advantage of them to the point where they are only signing or entering into the contract with you under duress that will be a voidable contract and if there's any dispute and it goes to court then the likelihood is a court will simply set it aside contracts for an illegal purpose that should be an illegal purpose on the slide or against public policy will not be enforced by the courts also capacity is an issue a party must have capacity to enter into the contract now an adult a person over 18 years of age has capacity to enter into a contract that's assuming that they're not being taken advantage of or are under a disability for example they may be suffering from a serious drug addiction or drug problem or under the influence of drugs or drink at the time also you may have people who have diminished responsibility or who have medical or psychological or psychiatric problems those people are under a restricted capacity to enter into a contract so that's something that you know needs to be borne in mind the person entering into the contract must have capacity to do so there are special rules for minors and for those under a disability so a minor can only enter into a contract with the benefit of a guardian terms of a contract then would include express terms so express terms are what you set out in the contract itself what is written in the contract there would also be implied terms for example in the contract of employment there would be an implied term that if you're an employee you're not going to rob your employer blind or if you're an employer that you're not going to treat your uh, employee like a slave so these are implied terms which are implied into all contracts uh, and all other implied terms in a contract of employment for example would be that both parties would be entitled to enjoy the trust and confidence of the other these things don't have to be spelled out they are implied into the contract terms then also of a contract can be conditions or warranties if a condition is breached well then the contract can be repudiated it can be just set aside set it not if a warranty is breached well then damages is the appropriate remedy for the aggrieved party contract can be void it can be voidable it can be unenforceable now it may be for the ordinary person and indeed for a solicitor sometimes to uh, may be difficult to differentiate between these three categories but uh, it's worth noticing that if for example somebody enters into a contract or two parties enter into a contract under a completely um, obvious misunderstanding or obvious mistake that's fundamental to the contract then the contract is simply going to be unenforceable avoidable contract would be one which uh, maybe a minor or maybe somebody under a disability has entered into but again all of these things will depend on the particular circumstances how do you end a contract you end a contract by performance in other words both parties perform uh, the contract for example if it was a contract of employment then both parties if it's for a fixed term for example maybe two year fixed term contract well then the contract is over at the end of the two years and both parties have performed the contract uh, it could be ended by agreement uh, part of the parties can agree just to end the contract for whatever reason it can be ended by uh, discharge by notice for example in a contract of employment again or indeed in a lease there will be a notice period which will allow you to 
terminate the contract, just end it. He can be discharged by operation of law. For example, if you're a lorry driver and you obviously are need your driving license to drive your lorry and do the job, then it's quite possible that uh, if there's a change in the law which renders your license unfit for the particular purpose that you need it, then it may well be that the contract is discharged by operation of law. In other words, something that's completely beyond your control. It can be uh, discharged by frustration. Again, a sales rep or somebody who needs their car, if they, as a fundamental part of discharging their duties and doing their job, if they, for example, lose their license uh, through drink driving or whatever, uh, then the contract will be at an end through frustration because uh, the party is unable to fulfil his or her duties under contract. Likewise, in an employment contract, if the employee is uh, ill and, and so ill as to not be able to perform the contract or perform the work for which she was employed, well then eventually that contract is going to be ended simply by frustration because the party is unable to discharge her duties. It can be ended by breach as well, obviously an employee or indeed a tenant or a landlord or whoever, uh, one of the parties can always breach a contract and the contract then can be ended in that way. Remedies for breach, well the most common remedy would be damages. There is also quantum merit, in other words this is getting paid um, to reflect the work that you've done. For example, um, a sufficient amount would be could be paid for work you've carried out perhaps under a misapprehension or perhaps where the other party has allowed you to go ahead uh, and perform work or perform a service or provide goods and then they stand back and say I never asked you to do that there's no contract in relation to that the situation here is that the other party has allowed you to go ahead and work away under a misunderstanding or misapprehension well then the law recognises that it would be unconscionable for the other party to benefit from that sort of thing so you will be paid or you'll be looking for from a court quantum merit in other words what your work is worth or what your goods were worth in other words a sufficient amount Specific performance is another remedy for a breach of a contract. So if you enter into a contract to buy, for example, a piece of property, you pay a deposit, you sign the contract, and then you're unable to complete. You could be sued for specific performance. A court may order that you perform you perform the contract and complete the sale, complete the purchase. You may have discovered that uh, the property is not what you thought it was or that there's some new development that's going to impact it. Well, if you've entered into a contract, you can be sued for specific performance. Performance. Likewise, a court can award an injunction. It can award an injunction for you to do something or to cease to do something. But again, breach a contract. These are the four remedies. There are various statutes then, laws on the statute books that deal with contract. The Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act 1980 is one that will impact you if, for example, you are a consumer or you buy a car or you buy um, stuff in, in a retail environment in a Liffey Valley shopping centre or wherever. A lot of your remedies or a lot of the protections for you as a consumer uh, and uh, as part of the contract will be set out in, in statute in the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act 1980. Likewise the Consumer Protection Act of 2007 and likewise the Land and Conveyancing Law Reform Act of 2009 sets out statutory remedies and statutory provisions in relation to a contract for the sale of land, the memorandum of um, the uh, evidence uh, to evidence the uh, contract and so on and so forth. So these are statutes which deal with contract but again to circle back to the very beginning, the points I made at the outset, contract is something that we come into uh, contact with on a daily basis. My name is Terry Gorey and I hope you find this video useful. If you do, you might give it a thumbs up down below and you might be interested in subscribing to my YouTube channel if you haven't done already. Thank you.